Well, hey folks, Jeff Salzman here and welcome to The Daily Evolver and to another episode of Post-Progressive Inquiries where my co-host, Steve McIntosh of the Institute for Cultural Evolution and I talk to interesting people about what's next in the evolution of consciousness and culture. And in the case of today's guest, Pia Mullaney, what's next in the evolution of economics? which I am extremely interested in and befuddled by. So I'm eager to have this conversation. So welcome, Steve. Would you like to introduce our guest, Pia Mullaney? Thank you, Jeff. Yes, I'm most pleased to have a distinguished economist uh, and friend, Pia Mullaney, on, on our program. Uh, Pia is co-founder and director of the Center for Innovation, Growth, and Society and senior economist at the, the Parent Institute, as I understand it, which is the Institute for New Economic Thinking, which we can abbreviate in this conversation as INETS, I suppose. Um, as INET senior economist, Pia focuses on economic, biological, and sociological approaches to human welfare. She's held positions at the Harvard Institute for International Development and the Center for International Development at Harvard's Kennedy School, where she worked in collaboration with Asian and African governments on the development of healthcare and economic policies. She's received a BA from Wellesley College and a PhD in economics from Harvard University. Uh, Pia currently lives in Los Angeles with her husband, Eric Weinstein. And she's asked me to uh, mention that her comments today do not officially reflect the views of INETS um, and that these are her own thoughts, which we very much appreciate. So welcome, Pia. Thank you so much, Steve. Delighted to be here with both of you. So first, I guess, uh, in 2018, right, the, the, the INITS spun off this, uh, the, 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 the center that you co-founded, right, the Center for Innovation, Economic uh, Growth, and Society. Maybe you can tell, tell us a little bit about that work and, and how it relates to the larger uh, issues. I mean, I, I, read, I read about deep innovation, right, which is a, a very interesting idea. I know it's transforming economics, but we're particularly interested in the, uh, the cultural evolution dimensions of that, but in general, right? We, uh, we wanna take the conversation where it naturally wants to go. But let me start by just asking you about the work you do at, um, at the center. Great, yeah. You know, I think it really is deeply tied with our cultural institutions. And I think that's something we sometimes tend to forget in economics. We tend to get very caught up in our models and we lose track of the fact that economics is really here to serve humanity and that we really do need to be thinking about it in a cultural framework. So it's interesting, I guess, uh, to think a little bit about where INET started originally. Um, it was founded right after the 2008 financial crisis. And I don't know if you remember back then, there was discussion of how the Queen of England went to visit the London School of Economics and she looked at the economists there and she said, how did you guys miss this? And this is really, I think, the question for our time. This was a huge financial crisis. There were clearly a lot of indications. Some people saw it coming. Economists really didn't. And interesting, I use the phrase sometimes when I talk about economists, um, I talk about economics squared because economists are very good at understanding incentives. And we study other people's incentives to the point where we understand motivations for doing all sorts of things, but we're particularly bad about studying our own incentives. So the question is what happens when you look at the incentive structures that economists face? And I do remember someone asking Marty Feldstein, who was a Harvard economist um, back right after the crisis, do you think economists had anything to do with this? Do you think economists' incentive structure has played any role in this? And he flat out said, no, absolutely not. And I remember looking at that thinking, you know, I taught undergraduates with this person, uh, Harvard undergraduates. And I'm pretty sure that if anyone, any one of his undergraduates had said that incentives have no role to play here, it wouldn't have really passed muster in his economics class. So the question is, you know, why were economists so quick to miss this? And I think in part, it lies with the idea that we tend to think about people within a framework of what we call homo economicus or economic man. An economic man is this deeply rational human being who sees things from a very self-focused perspective. 
And I should be clear, economics is a very powerful language. You can really use it to talk about almost anything, and you can take almost any idea and put it within the language of economics. But as we know from thinking in terms of culture, language itself is very powerful. So when we tend to think about things in a language of efficiency, we often get very caught up in this language. And what we find is that people who study economics often end up using it as a justification for behavior that is more greedy or selfish. So in fact, there was a recent study that was just done on firms in Denmark, where Darren Asabondo, who's um, an MIT economist and some of his colleagues, looked statistically at the outcomes of firms that had just hired MBAs. And what they found was that these firms statistically didn't show a rise in productivity, but they did show a decline in wages. So there's something about the mindset that we are bringing in from economics that is really affecting our values and how we think about things. So when I moved to Silicon Valley about five years ago, six years ago, I noticed that we at INET were talking so much about heterodox economics and how we needed to bring new economic thinking to the world. And in fact, what was happening in Silicon Valley was organically, we were seeing new economic thinking coming directly out of technology. And in fact, the new economists were the technologists. So I don't know if you've been tracking this latest um, issue that Janet Yellen is having with Bitcoin. And I sometimes have to ask, my, ask the question, who's doing the real economics here? I have tremendous respect for Janet Yellen as an economist, but I also have tremendous respect for Satoshi who developed Bitcoin. And if I think about what he's able to achieve in a world where we don't really have models to be able to understand what's going on, I have to believe that there is something that is actually shifting our entire economic framework that's coming out of the technology that is being developed in Silicon Valley. So this was some of the thinking behind what we're doing at the center. And my hope was to really work with innovators to develop the kind of culture around um, the new economics that was developing in Silicon Valley so that we can actually use the technology to shift our economics towards something that makes sense for society, towards something that works for the better of all, for, the, for all of us to improve, rather than see it benefit um, only particular segments of our population. And Pia, how would you describe that shift? What's next in terms of our you know, economic life? And how does this cryptocurrencies and new technologies enable it? Yeah, so I think we really have some say in terms of what's next. And I think we need to be very deliberate in terms of how we build the world that receives this kind of technology. What we've been seeing for the last 15 or 20 years is what economists sometimes refer to as K-shaped growth, where you see some people doing better and better and some segment of our economy doing worse and worse. Um, so that, you know, we're seeing inequality rise to some unbelievable levels. And you know, we can talk later about polarization and some of the issues around identity politics that I know have come up um, when I've talked with Steve. I believe that many of these things are deeply rooted in inequality. And so then the question becomes, what can we do about this? How do we think about it? And my belief is when you're thinking about the inequality issue, you can talk about um, redistribution after the fact or you can talk about pre-production structures in our economy so that we actually bring people along so that we don't have the kind of issue we're seeing now where we have a vanishing middle class and we have um, you know, people who are highly educated doing really well and people who have um, less than a high school education being pushed further and further below. We need to think about what happened to our middle class and how do we bring them along with this technological revolution that we're seeing so that it really benefits everyone. And I think this is a question that we need, this is a conversation that we need to be having with people within Silicon Valley, with people who are actually developing models. I'm hearing things now that I haven't heard for many years in economics. I'm hearing about things like developing industrial policy. You know, how do we actually think about structuring our economics so that we bring people along with us? And you know, I know Steve, you've been working a lot with this idea of conscious capitalism. How do we think about using capital and building companies that actually keep workers in mind. It used to be that we had a thriving union movement. That's really been squashed. So labor has very little say 
in what we do and how we do it now. And undoubtedly that has something to do with the fact that labor is not really being taken care of in this process. And I believe that this feeds very deeply into the polarization issues that we're seeing um, beset this country. Sure, I, I can follow up on that and ask one of the, the, the things we focus on regarding that, that are upstream or, or an important philosophical foundation of the shrinking middle class, the shrinking blue collar jobs and increasing globalization of the economy and globalists versus nationalists. We like to think of, of globalism and nationalism as ultimately interdependent levels of development. That, that sustainable globalism, non-tyrannical globalism depends on healthy nationalism, but healthy nationalism in turn uh, ultimately requires a degree of global integration and working these things out requires an understanding of the interdependence of these. And, and it seems like the Trump was a symptom in some ways of, of the nationalistic interests being somewhat ignored or uh, taken for granted by uh, global elites, economic elites. So in, in terms of, um, how we can think about restoring middle class and blue collar jobs, um, um, preventing the, the gross levels of inequality that threaten the democratic container, you know, of American society and other developed nations. What's your thinking about how, um, how we can think politically about the implications of nationalism in this inequality issue? Yeah. That's a really good question. And I have to admit, I have a somewhat cynical perspective on this. I believe that economic nationalism really used to be something that was the bastion of the economic left in this country. It's what progressives identified with. And when it came to trade, when it came to immigration, there was very much this basis in the American left that said, how do we think about the American worker? And then I think something very interesting happened. When Bill Clinton was in his first term, Newt Gingrich looked at the political scene and came up with this really interesting idea. He said, I wonder what happens if I just throw tons of money at the electoral process. And if you look at what happened in the 1995 congressional election, there were huge amounts of money that flowed in. And sure enough, the Republicans won that election. And in fact, if you look at the political spectrum, what you find is that empirical studies have shown that there's almost a one-to-one -one correspondence between the amount of money that is thrown at an election, who has more money and who wins the election. And there's been really interesting work by Thomas Ferguson and his colleagues on what he calls the investment theory of party competition, which shows that really, it's all about how much money you can raise in any given election. And I think what happened was Bill Clinton looked at this and he's a very smart man. He's like, you know, our voter base is really working class America. But if we're gonna get the kind of money that we need to be able to run these elections, it's not coming from working class America. We need to think about a donor class that may not look the same as our voter class. And I believe that a lot of the arguments that we started seeing around globalization with respect to trade and immigration took on a very different feel around that time. And I believe that the Democrats who really used to think of, the, of working class America as their base started seeing a split between their voter base, which was working class America, and their donor base, which was Wall Street and corporate America, which was able to pour the same kind of money into their elections that the Republicans were able to get. And if I look at what happened with NAFTA, if I look at what happened with immigration policy, I believe that what we suddenly started seeing was a shift in the rhetoric. I believe that a lot of what we're seeing in terms of identity politics is actually coming directly out of this political and economic problem. Because I believe that the Democrats realized that they now no longer had something to feed their voter base. And so identi identity politics became the perfect substitute for economic policies, which were much more expensive. And I really believe that the DNC, the Democratic Party, has been critically central to, being, to feeding the identity politics rhetoric that we're hearing now. And in fact, I think if you look at 
um, economic progressives, they often don't like what we're seeing coming out of critical race theory, for example. Because I believe the critical race theory took a lot of the language that was designed to work with um, underserved populations across the racial spectrum and chose to shift that language specifically to talk about things in terms of race. And from an economic perspective, if I look at what happened with respect to trade, for example, I believe Democrats were very careful about making sure they got experts to make their arguments for them so that we can make an argument for NAFTA that says everyone is better off. With respect to immigration, they got economists to make the argument for them that everyone would be better off with open borders. Now, it's interesting because Ezra Klein at some point asked Bernie Sanders, what do you think about open borders? And Bernie Sanders' response was, that's a Koch brothers proposal. So here we see something that used to be very much what the far right would believe was the right way to grow our economy, unfocused on distributional issues, and you're seeing it being adopted by the left. And it's very much wrapped in this notion of globalization. And my husband, Eric, likes to use this um, phrase that the um, idealism of any time is really the grift of the moment we're looking at. I don't have his exact words, but the whole point is that it suddenly became in the interest of the Democratic Party to start a global policy so that corporate America could benefit. And that was going to benefit, yes, it, it definitely did benefit the poor across the globe. And there is no question but that globalization has pulled thousands, hundreds of thousands of people out of poverty. The problem is, are you going to take care of America's working class, while, working class uh, voters while you do that? Or is, it, is this globalization come, going to come on the back of American working class, of America's working class? And I think this is where we started seeing a split in the left, so that you have the left that was very focused on globalization, on free trade, on policies that were going to benefit the world, and they absolutely do benefit the world. The only question is, do you actually look at the redistribution that needs to happen within America when we're talking about taking away the rights of American labor in order to benefit the rest of the world? So do we really want the growth of the poor of the rest of, the rest of the world to be on the backs of American labor? Or are we gonna make sure that corporate America also steps in and carries its fair share of the load. So here we are, um, January 28th, and this is, we're seven or eight days into the Biden administration. Mm -hmm. And just to focus it on the politics of the moment, and you know, we're coming off of Trump into Biden, how are you feeling? Are we moving in the right direction? How, and also, how do you interpret the economic policy of Trump versus Biden just in general? So the phrase that I've gotten fond of using is that I feel like we're now out of the fire and back in the frying pan. <laughs> and, you know, I see the Biden administration- That's progress. <laughs> yeah, it is progress, absolutely. Um, when I think about what Trump did to trash the cultural norms of our society and our politics, I feel like that was such a step backwards that we really, we, we were desperate. We needed someone who can pull us out of that, right? I also believe that Trump ran on um, a platform of economic nationalism. I do not believe that he had any intention of actually going through with any of those policies. He built a wall. You know, a wall is not gonna deal with the real issues around immigration. If you wanna deal with the people who are coming in from our Southern border, Look at American drug policy in Central America. Do something about the fact that we have economies that are collapsing there, and that's what's forcing people to come here. Deal with it at its root. And I have some hopes that we're going to see a shift in the, Trump uh, in the Biden administration so we actually take on some of these issues more seriously. My fear is that there will be some amount of rhetoric in the direction of identity politics and that we won't see it translate into anything that makes economic sense in terms of actually addressing the fact that we have a huge problem with our Gini coefficient 
that inequality has been rising, but I can hope I have my fingers crossed. We shall see. Yeah. Is there a politician that uh, is like Bernie maybe um, who is in the right lane as far as you're concerned? Somebody we should pay extra attention to. Yeah, I was very much a Bernie supporter in 2016. My fear is that the rhetoric around identity politics has now taken over so much of the Democratic Party that it's very hard to find a way to actually make the economic points, the progressive economic points that we need to make without getting caught up in this. So, you know, if I listen to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, for example, speak um, about economic issues, when I see her interview or grill people on the floor of the house about economic policies, I'm really impressed. And then I hear some of the identity politics stuff that comes out of it, and I find it very disturbing. So for me, the question really is, how do we separate these two? Because I do believe the identity politics came out of something entirely cynical. And I don't believe it's going to take us in the right direction. So if I look at Black Lives Matter, for example, you know, let me say I absolutely believe that we have structural racism in this country. If we look back on what happened when um, the slaves were freed and after the Civil War, instead of getting 40 acres and a mule, I really do believe that many parts of this country d discovered incarceration as a way to fill the economic hole of having slaves. So, and I, I believe that we're seeing it represented in today's society as well. I, you know, if you look at the numbers, it's very clear. African-American men will get 20% more time for the same crimes committed than white men do. That being said, if we're going to address the problems that this creates, we shouldn't be trying to take apart the nuclear family, which is something that was on the manifesto of Black Lives Matter until recently. We should be thinking about how, we, how do we address our legal system? How do we address our penal system? How do we actually look at the root causes of this instead of saying that the nuclear family is a problem and we don't believe in the nuclear family anymore? Because we know for a fact that the Statistics show us that if you grow up in a single family home, in a home uh, run by a single woman, that your odds of success are greatly lowered. Don't we want to make sure we provide the same ability to succeed to everyone? And why does it have to be based on color? If I look at the deaths of despair that we have been seeing now. There's been all this work that's come out from um, Angus Deaton and Anne Case where they look at the decline in life expectancies. This has been, for the most part, middle-aged white men who are suffering. And, you know, we talk about deaths of despair. I remember writing papers on this about the Soviet Union after the collapse of the Soviet Union, where men were drinking themselves to death because they didn't have jobs. They didn't know what to do with themselves. And there was just this frustration about not having any point to life anymore. Much of the decline in life expectancy we're seeing is a result of the gutting of the manufacturing sector. And this, you know, we can talk about universal basic income. We can talk about, you know, ways to ameliorate um, the economic situation. But I think it's more than that. I think we need to figure out how do we bring meaning to people's lives. And meaning very often comes through work. So we need to think about how do we create an economy which actually provides for everyone to be part of our growth process. So excellent. Um, I appreciate that, that thinking. Um, let me frame the, the question that Jeff and I and at the Institute for Cultural Evolution we talk about all the time regarding the, the, the political polarization in America and how that's in preventing us from solving otherwise, I would argue, solvable problems like uh, income inequality and the disruption of American workers and, and the consequent disruption of the family structure and, you know, it sort of cascades down in the society and in some ways leading to Trumpism. So one of the things that we are trying to do, and, and I'd like you to speak to this, is that we're trying to help people appreciate how these underlying intrinsic values are contributing to this situation. For example, one of the, the triumphs of progressivism as it's emerged over the last 50 years 
is to inculcate a, 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 what we might call a world-centric morality, right? Instead of a, a nationalistic morality that, that is sort of rooted in an ethnocentric version who, who's worthy of moral consideration, right? Progressivism has helped us not only care about people all over the world, but all sentient beings, right? So I see that as a very important advance. And, and in, in the struggle to bring about a world-centric morality, ethnocentric morality has been sort of vilified or seen as unnecessary, uh, where we now see uh, that the, 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 the problem with taking care of folks in, in the middle class who, uh, who, have, who have lost their jobs or otherwise been displaced by the globalizing economy, how we could get those who support that globalization to overcome their aversion to nationalism in general and ethnocentric morality in particular, to care about our own. In other words, to identify not as the, you know, the white male working class Trump voting other, but that as people who are us and that ultimately who we need to bring along to our democracy. So, I'm, I'm, you know, open borders you mentioned is an example. Clearly, if you have a world-centric morality, then, then you care about people all over the world, especially people in Latin America who are suffering. So that's a kind of a, a beautiful expression of world-centric morality to care about those immigrants. But at the same time, there's a, there seems to be this kind of blindness to how that affects um, you know, working class people, how that disrupts families, et cetera. So, that's not so much a question as a direction. I, I hope you can speak to it a little bit. Oh, absolutely, Steve. I have gotten so much about, out of hearing you talk about how we need to bring aspects of each of these orientations into what we believe is a good world and a good society. You know, there is so much in progressivism. I do think it's critically important. You know, I, I started my work in economics working in development. And, you know, I was working with governments in Africa to look at issues raised by pan pandemics with HIV AIDS and with malaria, it's very clear that we need a huge transfer of resources towards some of these countries so that they can start um, working towards their economic growth and they get the sustenance and support that they need. And you know, it, it's very clear that we have those kinds of resources in this country. The question is, where is it gonna come from? So, you know, it's interesting when I think about the economic models, I talked earlier about how the Democrats got experts to support them. If I just think about trade, for example, if you talk to an economist, they will generally tell you, well, if you look at the work of Ricardo back in the 1800s, we have a very clear sense as to why comparative advantage is a good thing. We use what we call the Pareto principle. Do you have a situation where you can make at least one person better off by making and make no one else worse off? In that case, you have a Pareto improvement. And this is our gold standard. So when we look at trade models, though, it's very clear that if you look at the actual model, what you're seeing is that you're seeing a transfer from labor. In what, what you're doing is you're essentially pushing out the supply curve. And you're seeing a transfer from American labor to, or let me take the case of immigration and makes it even more clearly. Because you, know, you push out the supply curve, you have a direct increase in labor, you have a decline in the wage. And very often you will have a growth, uh, some amount of growth, so aggregate demand grows up, so you have actual increase in um, GDP, and you will have some kind of a rise in wages for everyone. You're also gonna have this inefficiency that we've done away with called the deadweight loss. But the primary, the most important thing that you're going to see is you're going to see a transfer from American labor to American capital. And the question is, how do you redistribute that transfer? So if you can actually make sure that American labor is part of this so that we actually redistribute the gains so that it's a win-win for everyone, it makes complete sense. If you can make sure the trade is a win-win for everyone, it makes complete sense. But that's really not the way it works. What happens is that you have a win for American, for corporate America, and you have a loss for American labor. And yes, we care about making sure that we have a transfer to poorer countries, that we can bring people into our circle of empathy so that we show that, you know, this they are important to us. The fact that China has done so well, they've pulled hundreds of thousands of people out of poverty is critically important 
my claim is that we don't want to do it on the backs of American labor. We want to make sure that we're thinking about this redistribution in terms of our whole economy so that we make sure that it's the people who can afford to support these efforts towards the development of the rest of the world who are bearing that burden and not working class America, manufacturing America that has now been gutted. There is a reason that Rust Belt America bought what Trump had to sell because they were hoping that someone could actually hear them when they said, our jobs are disappearing. Yeah, um, it really hits home for me. I grew up in the Steel Valley of Western Pennsylvania, which is uh, really decimated at this point. And, um, and when I grew up, people had middle class jobs. My dad worked a job, my mother was a homemaker. We had a nice house, you know, modest house two modest cars, we, everybody was doing well. And I think there's a consensus that that is the, you know, the lost group, that, that's the people that we really need to focus on. Mm -hmm. So I want to get to a little bit granular with you, Pia, in terms of if you were president, so we have taxes, we have universal basic income, minimum wage, unions, these are the sort of pieces that I can see that have typically been you know, manipulated, uh, what would you do? What, what policies would you put in place? Or what do we need to do here? Hmm. I mean, I think minimum wage is an easy one, right? I, I don't know why our new minimum wage policy says we have to wait till 2025. Why aren't we making this happen now? And I think we know, the, the claim has always been made that um, you're gonna have economic effects and you're gonna see unemployment go up. We now have empirical studies that the effects on unemployment are really much smaller than we thought they would be. And the effects in terms of redistribution are much bigger. So I think minimum wage is definitely an easy starting point. I think we really need to be thinking about how do we address this issue of the vanishing middle class. Um, so from an economic perspective, I think we need to be thinking about how do we make sure that labor has a voice how do we make sure, you know, there is a term that I hear now in Silicon Valley, steering technology. It's an interesting idea because it may come with some efficiency effects, but my claim is that we're looking at income inequality that has now gotten to the point where we probably need to be thinking in terms of, you know, what are we willing to give up to make sure that we live in the kind of society that we want to live in. So, you know, I do believe we need to be thinking in terms of steering technology. We need to be thinking in terms of industrial policy. We need to be thinking about how do we actually pour money into areas that need it so that we can build economies? How do we create incentive structures so that people can actually bring workers into the process? I think we need to rethink our corporate tax structure. There is clearly a problem. You know, it, it, I've spent a fair amount of time in the work that I do for the center talking about antitrust. And antitrust is critically important because I think what we're seeing is that something we used to think of as being fairly exotic, which was a natural monopoly. With changing technology, we're going to be getting more and more of a situation where you know, you're gonna have one firm that just ends up having a comparative advantage and you're gonna have natural monopolies like you have with Amazon and Facebook and Google. And we need to think about what are ways that we can actually structure taxes so that we address the issue of natural monopolies because we have a changing economy now. We need to be thinking about how we address our tax structure. And you, you mentioned them all, our tax structure, minimum wages, unions. I think these are all critical pieces. I want to say, though, that I believe that the one thing that I believe drives all of this, underlies all of this, comes back to the political. I think unless we deal with the issue of campaign finance, we are not going to see any of the economic improvements that we need because it does not at this point make sense for Congress people, for senators who are so dependent on their donor base to make the kinds of changes that are going to benefit their voter base. And it all boils down to this. And I really, if, if I, see myself as a one issue voter, it would be on the issue of campaign finance reform. And more than anything, I think this was the reason I loved Bernie's campaign in 2016, because he was actually able to raise significant amounts of money through small donors. 
And I think unless we shift our system so that we are looking to our voters to tell us what they want, I don't believe that we're going to see the kind of economic changes that we need. Sure, that, that relates to a lot of the thinking that we do about cultural evolution. Um, other nonprofit think tanks that are in the field that we occupy, that are concerned with political polarization, like you name campaign finance reform as the, the primary fix to the intense polarization because of the, the gross misincentives that occur with, with donor interests and, and our you know, national interests as a people. And I thoroughly agree that campaign finance is badly broken and that we can trace much of the dysfunction to that. However, looking at that as a big, gnarly structural issue, we then have to ask, well, there's not the political will at the moment. In other words, with things entirely polarized, where one side has an effective veto on the positive programs of the other, it, it, in some ways, like the solution to the political will required to bring about campaign finance reform lies at this upper level of values, you know, where it's, uh, you know, we might agree to the solution, but we can't agree on how we're going to form the political will because we're at each other's throats that way. So how that relates is the, 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 it, as we're navigating this um, transition, you know, this century-long transition between nationalism and globalism and how those work out, one of the things that comes up is, is that we have, we have the international business community becoming more and more globally oriented, right? You know, Apple's based in Ireland or wherever. And, and then these, these, uh, these um, trusts, these, these monopolies, these natural monopolies, as you say, clearly need some kind of democratic oversight or they become anti-democratic as we've seen, you know, with issues of free, free speech, et cetera. So how we can improve political will is tied up with how we can improve um, the business segment of American society, which loops back to the sort of flip-flopping of issues between left and right, which you mentioned at the beginning, right? How economic populism used to be a democratic issue, now it's sort of a Republican issue. And one of the more specific elements where we're, you know, struggling in our own thinking and love to get your thinking more is on the... the, the um, the question of improving business, making capitalism more conscious, right? In, in bringing in the, the key technology of stakeholder integration, where, you know, it's a triple bottom line. A lot of these ideas are, have almost become cliche or, or subject to greenwashing or, you know, woke washing or some kind of corporate media campaign where they're just trying to make them seem like they're good actors when in reality they're doing all kinds of bad things. So without going too, too much, I'd love to hear you speak a little bit about labor unions because this is a specific issue that of course is, is uh, labor unions have a sentimental uh, spot in the viewpoint of the left but if, if making business more conscious this whole idea of stakeholder integration is, is disrupted by the old adversarial uh, uh, relationship between unions and management right which in the early part of the 20th century was a natural result of overreaching uh, uh, and bad behavior on the part of management. Now, unions were necessary. But I know that when you're trying to create a conscious company, if you have an adversarial labor union, then the opportunity to do stakeholder integration is significantly diminished. So how we can care about labor while making companies more subject to democratic oversight, making them more socially responsible and, and conscious, um, how labor unions and the you know, the, the sort of sense that we need those, how that can be reconciled with these larger forces. Yeah. If we look at Germany, for example, you know, we saw a significant decline in American unions in the last 40, 50 years. And the claim has often been made with globalization, it's very hard to have unions. It's very hard to actually um, keep the power of labor here when you can just outsource it. But if you look at what happened in Europe, that's not something that we see in Europe, right? Europe has very strong unions. And in fact, unions have a place at the table and it's not an adversarial relationship. Okay. In America, we used to have a system where, you know, Bill Dazonic has a lot of work where he talks about how the American worker used to join a corporation. You could start as a janitor and you could work your way up. So there was this idea that you would spend your life with a corporation you would build it with the corporation. Now, now that we have work being um, sent out, contracted out through all these different companies, and we have workers themselves 
feeling completely atomized so that we don't actually bring them into the process, we have a completely different relationship between workers and corporations. This whole idea of you know, uh, share, shareholder buybacks, there's something about that that makes it very clear that you're focused on this top corporate layer and the money that, is, that the corporation is making is not being plowed back into the corporation. So we need to be thinking about workers entirely differently and corporations entirely differently so that they are a process, they are part of the process of building a company and building a corporation. And we're seeing a few examples of this uh, with tech companies where there's actually an attempt to say what happens if we have a more um, uh, universal approach that we bring our workers in so that we have workers actually as stakeholders in the company so that they hold enough shares of the company that we make decisions together so that they have a voice at the table. And I think this would be something we need to be thinking about so that it doesn't end up with the same kind of adversarial position that we used to have in some sense with unions and, you know, which sometimes also came with a fair amount of corruption within the union system. So we need to be thinking about ways that we can actually not have the shareholders as being the ultimate determinant of what happens, but that we actually bring stakeholders into the process so that workers are part of the decision-making process. Yeah, you're here. Pia, you mentioned Germany, um, and uh, are there any other countries or parts of the world that you think are doing it right or doing it better, and in what ways? I mean, I'd have to say the Northern European model is one that we tend to look to a fair amount. And it's interesting, you know, I was very surprised in the 2016 campaign where Bernie was actually able to talk about being a socialist and that it didn't have the kind of reaction that I would have been expecting in this country. But he didn't really mean socialist. He meant the Northern European model, which, you know, that they call democratic socialism, which is really an idea that we believe in capitalism. There is no question but that markets have done more to bring people out of poverty than anything else we could have hoped for. So, you know, absolutely I believe we need a capitalist system. The question is how do you have a capitalist system where you don't ignore the um, features of capitalism that are inherent that are gonna lead to the kind of distributional problems that we have, that are gonna lead to the kind of corporate capture that we have of our government today. So, you know, how do you actually build a system where you have a market system, but you actually think about distributional issues, both pre-production and post-production? And I think, you know, this is actually an important distinction. It's we can think about taxing um, revenue and taxing profits, but I also think it's really important to think about the pre-production system. How do we bring workers into the process? And I think this is what many countries in Northern Europe are focused on doing. Yeah. How about, you, you mentioned that you, you did work in Africa uh, in, in de developing economies. What's going on there? I mean, what stage are they at or how do you see that? What's, what's the evolution of the economics in these developing countries at this point? Yeah, it's interesting to actually think about the issue of technology with respect to developing countries because what it's done in many cases it's, is that it's allowed the developing world to leapfrog over some of the issues that um, the developed world had to go through. So for example, infrastructure was a huge issue in many of these countries. We didn't have phone lines laid. Suddenly you have cell phones. You don't have to think about phone lines. And you know, cell phones have changed the way business happens in Africa, in India, um, across much of the developing world where you just, you know, suddenly you have this power in your hand and you have small credit and you have many ways of actually overcoming the um, infrastructure hurdles that used to be an issue. The flip side of that is that what used to be the way out of um, poverty for countries like China and uh, South Korea was small manufacturing. And the fact that they had labor that was cheaper. So to the extent that labor there was cheaper than it was in the developing world, you saw a lot of um, employment flow there. And then at a later stage with India, it became this idea of um, outsourcing call centers, for example. 
So, you know, service was a lot cheaper. So you, the problem that you're going to have now is that to the extent that we can automate even a lot of these service jobs, I think we're going to cut off that route to development for much of the developing world. So I think we have an interesting um, dilemma approaching us in terms of what are the paths to development going to be for the developing world as we see the technological changes that are coming down the pike? Sure, I, I wanna ask about your thoughts regarding the future of progressivism. You know, we've seen it gain a lot of cultural ground. It, it ha doesn't quite seem to have the power to elect uh, someone like Bernie Sanders at a national level. Um, but, but certainly it seems that the Biden administration is um, sympathetic to progressive concerns, although still uh, trying to retain a, a hold on the center. Um, we are also, I could say, Jeff and I, are sympathetic to progressive concerns, but we also would love to see a more evolved progressivism or even a post-progressive viewpoint that can um, better appreciate and include the interests of the whole instead of being distracted by a lot of the us and them um, uh, uh, problems of identity politics. You know, not that there's no problems there, but like you said at the beginning, that does take our eyes off the, uh, the economic inequality ball and that that's ultimately a, a lot of what's disrupting our politics is the destruction of the middle class, which our democracy needs, right? So one of the ways that we hope to see progressivism evolve is to recognize that they do get a lot of juice. They get a lot of political will generated by being anti-business or anti-capitalist by straw manning capitalism as you know simply a, a negative um we we'd love to see a more pro-business progressivism that recognizes you know the tendencies of, of globalism and the tendencies of selfishness and how there are some parts of the business world that are striving to become conscious and others happy to be as ruthless as ever so i'm just curious as how we might make economic freedom, even in the context of a robust social welfare system, how we can make that, how we can help progressives appreciate the necessity of that. Yeah, so, you know, the word progressive has also gotten laden down with so many things. So for me, it's really important to separate out this idea of economic progressive from the identity politics stuff. And I should say that if you talk to some of the uh, more extreme economic progressives, if you listen to some of the folks over at Jacobin and, you know, people who really believe in almost a Marxist ideology, economic ideology, they really don't like critical race theory. Um, and they don't like the fact that we're creating these divides around, along race lines because it really should not be about that. It should be about everyone having a fair shake and everyone having access. And if you do it based on someone's race or color or gender or um, other forms of identity, I think you're really shutting people out. So um, I think the first step for me is to understand that we do not want to be discriminating against people on the basis of their skin color. And you know, I say this as a person of color, um, but I don't think I want to discriminate against people who are white or black or brown. I don't want to discriminate against people on the basis of their gender. Um, their sexual preferences. I think this is what progressivism was originally meant to be. And I would like us to go back to taking back the word so that it means something that I think you are defining as post-progressive, which is that, you know, we, we want to actually bring everyone in. We want to believe that this is something we can make happen for everyone. And, you know, I do believe that the roots of it lie in the economics. So, you know, if you think about the fact that it is now so hard for many people in America to achieve this dream of owning their own home, or it used to be that you could expect that you would um, do better than your parents. Some huge percentage of children born in America in 1950 could believe that they would do better than their parents' generation. That's much less true now. And what this means is that it becomes harder for people to get married, to have children, to have homes and families. We're seeing a rise in single family homes. We're seeing much of the destruction that we notice in our cultural fabric, I believe as a result of the economics and the economic inequality that we're seeing. So I really believe that the first step is to address the economics and that much of the cultural 
stuff that we would like to see will follow from that. And, you know, I, I absolutely agree with your framework for what a post-progressive post needs to be. I think we need to accept what was good about a conservative framework in terms of understanding the role of family and the role of community and, you know, having respect for people's belief in religions or, you know, whatever other um, forms of community that people invested in. I also believe that, you know, we need this inclusivity that comes with the, um, with more progressive ideas, right? And I, I believe, you know, the global inclusivity, um, national inclusivity, I absolutely agree with you. I believe that the roots of all of this lie in the economics. So to the extent that we can actually figure out how to bring American labor back into the conversation so that they have a seat at the table, so that they have a stake in how we build our economy, I believe that we'll address many of the cultural issues that we're seeing as a result of the fact that we have got it our middle class. Sure, makes sense, thanks. Yeah, um, on the cultural side of the street, um, I know your husband, his brother, Eric and Brett Weinstein, uh, part of the intellectual dark web, and so that's been a phenomena in the culture. Uh, how do you see that evolving, or you know, what's the effect of Trump? Um, you know, where is sort of an is it, what's your view for you have a sort of an inside view here of what's going on with the intellectual dark web and um, you know where that's going? Yeah. It's been very interesting to see the progression. Um, I don't think it was ever, I don't think Eric ever had the idea that we'll have some kind of a formal um, designation for people. I think it was almost this tongue in cheek um, phrase that he came up with, you know, <laughs> it has this very mysterious intellectual dark web. Um, and there was something that was supposed to be ironic about it. Um, it ended up taking on a life of its own, I think in part because what we saw was people really willing to have conversations that were more open. Uh, and I believe the need for that has gotten ever greater. Um, it's been hard to sit through the last four years and watch the division of this country. And I've been really impressed that Eric has been able to maintain his footing in terms of understanding both sides of this. And, you know, he uses the phrase Wokistan versus Magistan, which I feel really captures it because, you know, there's madness on both ends, extreme ends of the spectrum. Wokistan and what? What's the other one? Magistan. So, you know, MAGA and the people who believe oh, in- Oh, Magistan, okay. Magistan <laughs> and yeah. Wokistan, where you have the crazy identity yeah. politics. Really. I don't think either of those are good for us. I don't think either of those are where we want to be going. Um, and the question is, how do we find that middle ground? And I think that, you know, I, I've seen the collection of people in the so-called IDW with different perspectives and ended up ending up going in different places. I think it's important for us to understand that the extremes on either side are not gonna get us where we want to go. And we really need to go back to trying to understand what I believe is the critical issue, which is how do we deal with the problem of income inequality in this country? And how do we deal with actually taking care of people so that they can fulfill their cultural needs without going to these extremes? So, you know, I, I actually believe that the, the Democratic Party was very cynical in terms of the way it fed the identity politics stuff. When I think about Hillary Clinton bringing up um, a, a young um, immigrant, a non a, a Hispanic child with no papers, um, who was technically illegal, to make the point that the Democrats believe in open borders or that we support um, illegal immigration to some extent. I thought it was really cynical because I think she was looking at how she could actually tap into a particular voter base. And, you know, I, I clearly believe that what we've done with Trump under Trump with immigration is horrendous on the, and I, I, but I do believe that, you know, we have to be thinking about American labor also. And as I said, if we want to actually, 
make sure that we don't have the kind of immigration problems we have. The, the best thing we can do is actually address the problems that we have created in the home countries of these people, rather than say, open the borders and let them all into America, because we're clearly not going to be able to accept all of Latin America into America. So, you know, how do we, how do we think about this at the root level? And I think um, Eric has been very effective at actually dealing with some of the rhetoric around this and taking it apart. And then there's the question of what are the underlying economic issues, which I think he and I are mostly in agreement on, though I am probably somewhat more progressive than he is on some of the economics. Um, but I think really the issue is how do you address the rhetoric and the culture in a way that it feeds back in on the economics. So I tend to start from the point where I think about the economics and I see how it feeds back into the culture. And I think he has a very clear sense that the culture is feeding back into the economics and you can't ignore the movement in that direction too. Right on. Great. Great. Well, my final question then is about centrism. I just published a paper uh, in an academic journal last month called Why Centrism Fails. <laughs> and although certainly I mean, it, centrism would be great if, we, if it was viable. But even in the intellectual dark web, for example, we've seen the centrifugal forces uh, that whereby those who were originally in this sort of politically nondescript movement have now been either thrown to the right or uh, um, you know, repelled by the right in a way that they just distinguish themselves for understandable reasons. And if we have, you know, as you mentioned, Wokistan and, and Magistan as these you know, disruptive forces, the, the at least superficial thinking is that we just need to, as some centrists, uh, John Avalon, a prominent centrist journalist, he says, we just need to sort of cut off the wing nuts, as he calls them, um, mm -hmm. and, and meet in the middle. I mean, this is sort of standard rhetoric from centrism for decades. But it seems as though um, that those forces are very strong and, and getting stronger. Centrism, the center cannot hold, <laughs> so to speak. And I'm just curious as to um, whether you think there's a possibility of a, of a higher center as we're groping our way toward, or, or um, what's your thinking about the future of centrism? I think if so many people in this country didn't feel so marginalized, we'd have a better shot at centrism. I think the problem is that we've really destroyed the futures of so many people that it's not surprising that they're getting more and more extreme. And you know, rather than giving them the kind of rhetoric Trump did to fill this hole in their lives, we need to give them something that makes sense. We need to build a world where they actually feel like they have a future, that they can strive towards something that makes sense. And I believe that this is our best shot at getting to a powerful center. Yeah, right on. So, P, I'll shift a little bit. It's my final question, and that is maybe a little bit personal, but what, what are you reading? What's inspiring you? What's got you lit up, and what's new for you? New for me. So, you know, it's, COVID has been very interesting. Um, we've, in some sense, managed to reach people all around the world because now all my meetings are online so I can attend things in any different part of the world that I want, which has been great in terms of being able to reach out. And, you know, even for the meetings that we host at SIGS and INET, we have people from all over the world able to plug in. So my conversations at that level have gotten very interesting. It's also very isolating because you don't actually get to meet people and connect at a personal level. Um, so um, I have been, I guess, immersing myself in trying to understand something of what the pandemic has been doing to us, what it means for our future. You know, I, what I noticed at the very beginning of this pandemic is that we used to talk about what the future would look like, what would happen to the future of work, what would happen um, as various jobs were replaced um, by social platforms. And what we find is that it came much more quickly than we could ever have imagined. COVID just speeded everything up. So the thing that has been really, I guess, um, the center of my focus is how we're seeing the future of technology really become the present of technology and how we're seeing the shifting of our world happening right in front of us at some speed that we could never have imagined. Yeah, it, it's, it's like we jumped ahead 10 years. You know, Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Well, anything else that uh, you'd want to put on the table here, Pia, before we close off? 
It's been really interesting for me to see the work that you folks are doing in terms of thinking about what's important in everyone's perspective. How do we bring it to the table? How do we take the best of all sides of this and actually allow them to flourish without getting caught up in one side or the other? And I really appreciate the conversation that you all are bringing um, and you know, bringing us all into so that we can think about ways in which, can actually, in, in which we can actually get to a better world and a better society. So I just want to say how much I appreciate the work that you folks are doing oh. to um, move us forward. Well, thank, thank you very much. much. Yes, indeed. And thank you for joining us today. So if people yeah. want to learn more about your work, can you um, give us a, 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 you know, a website they can visit? Sure. Um, so the work for the center can be found on cigs-inet, um, I-N-E-T dot O-R-G. Or you can go to the INET website at ineteconomics.org and you'll see some of the work that INET is putting out and many of the interviews that I did during the early part of COVID, trying to understand where we were and how the economy was moving. Great. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, P.M. Thank you. I appreciate you. Very much. Enjoyed talking with both of you. All right. Okay.